House of the Dragon and before it, A Game of Thrones, we have portrayals of competing, often interrelated families that are, well, quite murderous. They go after each other. They're ambitious. They take each other's power, each other's claims, sometimes from rival families, sometimes from within the same family, sometimes a mix of both because of all the interconnectedness of families. Mm -hmm. With this episode today, we're going to get into how realistic is that? Obviously, dragons and magic isn't very realistic, although in some ancient societies, they did believe in those things. So, but we're really going to get into how realistic the portrayal of this bloody, murderous uh, quest for power or this need to survive in a environment where People are questing for power and killing each other over it. Sometimes you just get sucked into the machine rather than being someone that's out there trying to murder a lot of people in order to claim power or to stop them from claiming yours. So we're going to get into how realistic that is by bringing up a variety of real world examples throughout history, long stretches of time, different cultures, different religions, different situations. And ultimately, we're going to try to answer this question. Is the real world worse, better, about the same? We'll see where we land after these discussions go. This episode is a collaboration with Daniele Bellelli of the History on Fire podcast. This is our second episode together. We did one almost exactly five years ago called History on Fire and Blood. And it was rooted in inspirations from history on Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. So this one's a bit of a similar structure, but a significantly different topic. Hey, Daniele, how you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. This is a great topic. I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, this is one of those, um, like so often when I tackle historical topics, I tackle one story, right? And I follow one story from beginning to end with all of its characters. And then I may draw some more general conclusions about the nature of history and human mind and what our priorities are and all of that. But the thing that what I like to do today, that where we're going, is the fact that we're going to do the opposite. We're not going to stick to one story. We're going to go into a bunch of different stories. And the the common theme is uh, this idea of this quest for power. You know, what is it about human beings that drive them? And as you said, not in one place, not in one culture, not at one point in history, but in the majority of civilizations out there, you find this quest for power turning murderers and even turning murderers within your own family, which is the thing that gets me the most. Because, you know, people competing with one another, well, we all understand that. That's a given. We understand that that's how it is. But when it's taken to the point where you see siblings killing each other, parents killing kids, or the other way around, that's taking the quest for power a little bit far, which clearly begs some questions regarding what's the psychological makeup of these people, what is that's driving them to these extremes of murdering all their relatives in the name of being the top dog in the empire. And I think this is what This is something that fascinates me because it's more of a big question of history as opposed to being a small, narrow story with bigger implications. This is we start from the big question and we look at the specific examples. Yeah, well said. Yeah. And we also wonder why, say, George R. R. Martin is fascinated by this or other people are. I mean, I'm fascinated by it, too. (laughs) So I kind of get it on some level. But one of the maybe criticisms of House of the Dragon, it was less of a criticism of Game of Thrones, was that the characters, a lot of characters aren't very likable. But I think that as we go through these examples of the real world, we'll see that that's fairly realistic. When you have people struggling for power, it does kind of corrupt you. It strips away a lot of the things that we would recognize as normal humanity. I think a lot of those things get destroyed in these quests for power, like uh, the little things like hobbies and kindness and compassion. Those get ground under the wheel to use a metaphor Daenerys used. It's a pretty decent metaphor in this spot, just that these regular things that make us human have to be cast aside. And that makes it difficult for us to make some of these comparisons because we have to think not only are these people in different times and places or in fiction in the case of House of the Dragon, but they have much different cultural beliefs and upbringings (laughs) and different views of the world that for us is maybe hard to wrap our heads around. So that's why we're going to also take a lot of time to consider the systems these folks lived in, what their society was telling them what is right and wrong. For example, in some cases, murdering your family, go back far enough, murdering family members wasn't that big a deal to certain folk. 
And right. the, now in modern times, it's more and more abhorrent. And it's, you know, it's an ebb and flow of what is and what isn't acceptable. But regardless of how acceptable killing your own family members is, these same things <laughs> still happened. Whether it was acceptable or not, yeah. people still did it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So why are people drawn to these things? Like you said, ego, meaning in life. Yeah, I think that's eventually after we will, you as listeners will take you guys along for all these examples. And eventually, after a while, it's going to start sounding redundant. And that's part of the point is that this is happens everywhere. And the stories start playing out the same in so, so many different contexts. Yeah. So after we go through all of them, then we're going to get to the point of the, okay, now what? You know, what are the implications of this? What does it say about why do people do it? Why do some societies do it and others don't? Why? Because, I mean, it's a peculiar thing to, especially in places where your choice is not to get killed by your brother, but all you had to do was to be loyal to your brother and loving and let them know that you have your back at every step of the way, and you get to enjoy spot number two in the empire, your whole job is just to sit back, enjoy the most privileged life anybody can have, pat your brother on the back, let them know that they have your support the whole time. And you could have pretty much the ideal life. And yet, over and over again, many people choose not to go down that path. And they are down to start in bloody civil wars that if they are successful, they are built on getting the crown by killing your siblings. And if they are unsuccessful, you just threw away the possibility of having a fantastic life in the name of being the top dog in the empire. You win or you die, that old thing, right? <laughs> yes, that raises some questions. And I think one that's interesting is in some way we see it even in sort of, I wouldn't call this historical, it's probably more mythological, like the stories of Achilles, for example. Mm. Now, we do know that there was such a thing as the Trojan War. We do not know if any of the characters are even remotely historical or not. Right. But the Achilles stories that told by Homer is one that, like, the myth of it is powerful because the story goes that his semi divine mother told him, You have a choice in front of you. There are two paths that you can follow one that will lead to a long, happy life, but nobody will remember your name. And another one is going to be short and bloody and glorious. Your name will last forever. But, you know, it's going to be a life of warfare and then you die rather quickly. And, you know, eventually we do know that Achilles chooses the short and glorious one. Which, again, glorious is an interesting thing in itself because glorious built on killing people, on being a warrior. Not because you, you know, save kids from cancer. Not because you did <laughs> something that we would all recognize as, oh, what a wonderful contribution to humanity is. By killing people, by exerting this warrior power, essentially. So the whole thing gets interesting, and people have then spun other myths on it, on whether Achilles was actually afterwards, after he died and he was uh, in Hades, whether he was happy with his choice or not, whether he had regrets or not. You know, there are many further myths that be built on it, but the basic myth of choosing short, bloody, war-filled life, but lead to your name lasting forever, to happy, peaceful, long one, and nobody will remember you, seems to be very much at the core of all the examples that we're going to be looking at. That's a great point. Yeah, I think Achilles is, and that is a really powerful message because it's like almost like the, the ancients, people like Homer, had figured this out that long ago, that you can't have both. You can't have glory and a happy life. You can't have, you can't be remembered forever, at least not as a warrior, and have a happy life both. Yeah, these two things don't go together. And it's almost like, boy, if we'd only listened to that, <laughs> message thousands of years ago, even if it never really happened, we'd be living in a much different society or other, at least some societies would be different. Like you said, this has played out over the world countless times, even must have played out before Achilles because they had to have learned that at some point, but the history wasn't really written down back then, but they clearly knew. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of begs the question, and it's a question that we're not going to be answering today, but it is an interesting one. Of If you look at the history books, why is it that everybody who makes it in the history books, overwhelmingly, 90 plus percent of people are essentially power hungry psychopaths? You know, yeah. the, what we know as history is the history of rulers mostly killing each other or wiping out each other's population in a quest for power. 
you, the sweet lady who helps her village and makes some great contribution to make people happy around her does not make the history books. So history, the way it's recorded, is heavily tilted in favor of people who are psychologically at the fringe. Let's yeah. put it that way. Um, have, like nice people rarely make the history books. And in that self, it's like, why do we do that? Why do we not tell more stories that are built on people who are actually sweet and good human beings? Yeah, you know, why <laughs> when they do make the news, stories? it's like, because they're aggressively nice or just incredibly nice, like a Gandhi or someone who's just like right. the nicest person you can imagine. You know, it's like a god, the god of niceness, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tricky thing it's a tricky thing and that in itself is uh of course that's a separate question but it's an interesting one it's like why is it that so much of history is uh i mean most of history is history of warfare really yeah that's the majority of what we focus our attention is warfare and who's in power at the head of the state that's the bulk of it that's really an interesting thing for me personally because i consider when i was younger i considered myself a fan of history i mean of course i still am but i didn't realize that when I would talk about history with other people, it was pretty much always military history and warfare and stuff. And I didn't really realize that. And it was one day I was like, really, am I a history fan or am I a military history fan? I set out to be one and ended up the other just without realizing just because of this, the system that we have for recording history is very overly focused on killing and power and things like that. Well, really power and the things that people do to get it, which includes killing. I mean, maybe if it was yep. just killing, that m wouldn't be as historical. But yep. certainly it, it has become that way. So we have a, a large list of examples. And I think we're going to really focus on, like Danielle said, a lot of the ones that are the most outstanding in terms of human behavior that is the most objectionable. So, yeah, killing your own family members is about as bad as it gets. Obviously, you can murder yep. lots of citizens, innocent people, and that's worse than killing one brother in the scheme of things. But it's a little maybe harder to understand the mindset there for someone you grew up with, someone you were around all the time. Maybe you've got a brother or sister you really don't like, and it's actually kind of easy to understand, but <laughs> that, that can't cover all the example. That doesn't cover all our bases. <laughs> now, George R. R. Martin, to his credit, he, as a good storyteller, found a way to enhance this whole angle, which is funny that we need to make killing your own family members more salacious than it already is. But in Westeros, mm -hmm. the taboo is called kinsling. It's pretty straightforward. The word describes what it is very well. It's quite taboo in Westeros, in the North especially, but it's a cultural belief shared throughout the entire country, the entire continent. And I think by George turning it into a cultural taboo, well, it, it becomes more dramatic when it happens. And then when it happens a bunch of times, it's just the drama piles up and it gets even more interesting. So, And the closer the relation, the closer the kin, the greater the sin. Uh, that's that's not his rhyme, but it works. Yep, I like it. Uh, you know, <laughs> kin slaying, like kind of like the real world. Kin slaying mm -hmm. in battle is sort of fair play, both in Westeros and the real world, really. Though if it's by your own hand, that can yep. get a little tricky. So we're mostly talking about when you kill, t talking about killing your own family. We're mostly talking about like assassinations and executions. Death in battle is a little different. And there's less of that anyway when we're talking about this. Uh, ironically, it seems to be easier in the real world to have gotten away with fratricide, parasite, matricide, all the other sides in the <laughs> real world than in, in Westeros, which is, you know, we've got this fantasy world where the, the violence is, is turned up to 11, but... Honestly, looking through real history, and it's pretty easy to find worse, yeah. <laughs> Wor you know, worse ethical situations or bigger murders or family members who were just worse. hundred uh, percent. And that's why, in fact, I think House of the Dragons, nobody can accuse it of being unrealistic. Again, dragons aside. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah that part aside. Part yeah. <laughs> If anything, you know, and that's a personal question for people digging their own entertainment. If anything, it's hyper realistic. And, you know, the, if, if there is a the possible downside is the fact that all the characters are so damn unlikable that, because yeah. they are too much like reality. Yeah. And some of us, you know, when you want to be entertained, you want something that actually makes you feel a little bit better about existence, <laughs> not the kind of stuff that you can see. Yep, that's exactly how people are. This is exactly how so many... You want to focus on the happy exception sometimes, you know, and this is definitely not, you know, this is showing precisely the power games have, as they have been played throughout history 
and the kind of human beings that get wrapped around it. Either they start that way or they are morphed into that as a result of being part of this power game and not really being strong enough to be able to make a difference in changing the nature of the game. And how much of it is and, encouraged? Like, that's a, re- a thing in House of the Dragon yeah. right away, where t- there's two branches of the same family where one family expects to inherit and the other side is, is paranoid about what's going to happen to them. Alicent is convinced by her father, Otto, through his relentless repeating of this point that no she's going to kill your kids she's going to kill your kids and she's like she doesn't have the personality type to do that she's not going to do that and and from from the viewer's perspective like it doesn't really seem like Rainier is going to kill Allison's children but Otto says it's not about her she'll have to in other words the system demands it of her whether she wants to or not the people around her will tell her to do it or force her to do it or do it on her behalf and then just say well uh, ask for forgiveness later you know that kind of thing And if we look at our own histories, the world of the entire world, murder of family members is wrapped up in all these different myths, legends, and real histories. The first ever fratricide in Western history is Cain and Abel. In Egyptian history, Osiris is the brother of Set and kills him. Attila the Hun killed his brother Bleda to become king of the Huns. Romulus killed Remus in, in founding Rome. Caracalla what? killed Geta in Rome many years later. But that was kind of a problem for him, actually. It was seen as monstrous and it was supposedly haunted him. So even though it's part of their founding myth, you know, a thousand years later, it became a problem. And, and that's something we're going to see today is that the closer you get to now, the more unacceptable it is. It still happens, but the larger social penalty, the larger pushback. It's not necessarily enough pushback, but it, you know. <laughs> yeah, we frown about it a little more. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, here's a great example. The Ottoman Empire. This is an actual quote from Mehmed II, the Conqueror. And then he said, of any of my sons that ascends the throne, it is acceptable for him to kill his brothers for the common benefit of the people. The majority of the ulama have approved this. Let action be taken accordingly. Now, that sounds awful, right? But why did he do this? Because their tradition was for the brothers to start civil wars. So this was actually less bloody. He's like, yes, fratricide was illegal. And he he legalized fratricide to make Mm -hmm. things less bloody. (laughs) Mehmed III, a couple like 150 years later, executed 19 of his brothers and half brothers when he came upon the throne. And then Ahmed I, and 150 years after that, then did ban fratricide. Okay, we banned fratricide and they replaced it with a seniority system where the oldest takes over and rampant <laughs> imprisonment. So instead of killing, they would throw them in jail. So it was, it, it's like, boy, the history takes hundreds of years to move from murder to life imprisonment. So it's, the, 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 it moves very slowly, this whole thing. Yeah. But yeah. And the most famous, the most famous fratricide example of all time the Lion King, of course, a real story, right? That's that that wasn't fiction. That really, <laughs> but like they even show that stuff to kids. I mean, it's just how common yep. it is. Like fratricide is so much a part of our own world history and everything that it pops up in children's cartoons as like the thing that kicks it all off. So I don't want to kind of give a little too much away of where we're gonna go toward the end when we start drawing on the implications. But to me, it really is the result of uh, cultures that encourage competition at all costs. And I'm not saying that there is not some value in competition, because of course there is. But when it's extreme competition, where it's competition tilted to the 10th power, and then instead downplays tremendously the value of cooperation, the value of uh, uh, let's figure out a system where I get what I want and you get what you want. Whereas instead it's all built on a zero-sum game kind of psychology. Yeah, And the examples, I mean, there's there are so many, right? I mean, you just throw out there a few that are perfect. Like each one of those could be its own. Uh, one of the ones that I started playing with uh, very early on in History on Fire, and kind of by chance, this was just episode four and five. I had a two-part series about this one Persian civil war that took place in the 400s BC. Um, And the reason why is because we have a lot of testimony also by Greek mercenaries who participated in this Persian civil war. But you have this tale where you have these two brothers. You know, the king was Artaxerxes II, and his brother was uh, Cyrus the Younger. And really, Cyrus could sit back, 
enjoy governorship of part of the empire, live in the ultimate luxury, have everything that a human, like there was pretty much no one as privileged as he was anywhere other than in a few other societies around the world of people who could match him, but he didn't really get any better. And of course he chooses, no, screw all that. <laughs> I'm going to recruit mercenary, raise my troops and go after my brother in this bloody civil war. He gets killed in the civil war. Artaxerxes, you know, Cyrus is killed in battle. And these in itself start a spiral of more bloodshed because, for example, one of the things that's going to happen is that, and this is where uh, J.R.R. Martin definitely shows you this, this is not just a male story. This is not just brothers killing each other. For example, the mother of both Cyrus and Artaxerxes, she was pretty mad because she really liked Cyrus. And she was mad that their son had died, despite the fact that he kind of brought it upon himself. Yeah. But that's really <laughs> And he really didn't like uh, her daughter-in-law, who had married Artaxerxes, who was uh, essentially the queen for all uh, intents and purposes. There were some rivalry that were made worse by the civil war between the two brothers. And then one day, this queen mother, Parisatis, invited her daughter-in-law to dinner. And then as soon as they are done, the daughter-in-law rolls over and dies, clearly poisoned. And the story is that she probably had, because, uh, you know, everybody knew that we, within the family, everybody's out to get each other. So Poisonings were common. In that, probably yeah. had their eye <laughs> looking at, like, what is she serving me? What is she doing? So in order to defuse suspicion, she had uh, cut a single bird that they were going to split and uh, eat together. They don't say exactly what it was, but like some kind of bird that they were going to eat. And the theory is that she used the knife on which she put poison on one side of the knife so that as she cut it, the poison went on the side that went to the daughter-in-law without poisoning her, even though they were eating the same animal. <sighs> and <Jeez>. um, <laughs> boom. So daughter-in-law eliminated. Wow. And then you realize, okay, this is not just these guys. It's not just Cyrus that started this problem or these ladies who have a rivalry. Like if you look at the father of Cyrus and Artaxerxes, he was involved in a whole thing where, uh, you know, the legitimate heir to the throne was uh, murdered by one brother. And then he murdered his other brother to take the throne and then prevented another brother yet from murdering him. So, <laughs> you know, it was like a everybody kill each other kind of thing. If you go to the next generation, Artaxerxes III, upon taking the throne, proceeded to kill 50 of his brothers. 50? Because, you know, Jeez. well, because, you know, Artaxerxes II, like, what's the point of having an empire if you have, don't have a great harem? So he had <laughs> three, like, three zillion concubines. And, um, and so Artaxerxes III, third, okay, like, how do we start making sure that I that I get to keep this power? Let's start by killing every one of my brothers, and there are a whole lot of them. So it's like, you know, you kind of start getting the vibe that this is not a one-time thing. This is not just uh, this particular generation, something went wrong. It's almost... I don't want to say expected, but kind of. Yeah, it's like it's prehistorical, I think. Like, well, that's why we have examples that are from times that aren't well recorded, like Homer and the Bible mm -hmm. and things like that. Clearly, it was normal even in those times. Like they were they were mm -hmm. used to it before written history existed. So, yeah, it's as old as armies and battle and hunting and <laughs> things like that. Yeah, you can imagine that cavemen occasionally would murder each other even within the same family probably i mean we still see it in the animal kingdom uh we talk about the lion king it's not uncommon for mm -hmm. a male lion to kill all the other male lions around right. when they establish dominance over a pride and so when we say george is fascinated by this it's not he's particularly fascinated by this, this is a real thing that's happened that said he has done a lot to popularize the <laughs> the idea i think i've pointed this out on the show before but it bears repeating when i looked up fratricide on wikipedia there's examples from film there's examples from books there's examples from other things there was 10 examples from books. Six of the 10 examples from Wikipedia were George R. Martin. <laughs> so, <laughs> more than half. Yeah. So there you go. Um, sticking with that, of course, George, part of the reason that is George 
is inspired by real history. He uses a lot of real history as the basis for at least parts of his stories. It's well known that the Wars of the Roses is an inspiration for the early part of Game of Thrones. Stuff that's mostly the first book, second book. By the time you get to later in the second book, third book, fourth book, it doesn't really have much to do with the Wars of the Roses anymore. But by the same token, House of the Dragon is loosely based on the anarchy, and it, which is also a, a time period in England. And the anarchy... Well, without the anarchy, we might not have had the Wars of the Roses. They're pretty far apart in time, several hundred years, but they definitely involve a lot of the same bloodlines, a lot of the same families and same territories. We get the crowns of France and England and all that. But as we said, we're going to move farther and farther back in time. The way the Wars of the Roses went, there was a lot of war between families. But in terms of murderers and assassinations, there wasn't a whole lot of that with a couple of notable exceptions, one being the infamous Princes in the Tower scenario, which was uh, certainly popularized by Shakespeare and just by the fact it's a great story. Lots of books have been written on it. That was Richard III, who locked up his own nephews after usurping the throne from them, and then they just sort of disappeared. (laughs) Their bodies still, no one even now, I think, knows where they ended up. So they're... um, yeah, that was a thing. So he probably had them murdered. That's, we don't know for sure. But he probably killed his own two nephews, took the throne, and didn't have it for very long. But you go back a little farther to the anarchy, which, which like I said, is where the House of the Dragon is inspired. You have a Empress Matilda usurped by her cousin, King Stephen. And neither side really could get the upper hand for very long. Stephen was never actually overthrown. But... It was war for a long, long time, more than a decade. There was on and off of fighting. And these families, as big as they were, as big as as spread out as they were, it's it's different time. Like you said, Daniele, they started to get a better idea of what they could do besides rule. Being king of the English was nothing like being emperor of Persia. The king of England in the 15th century had considerably less power than the emperor, the great king of Persia. There's no harem. <laughs> There's no ridiculous wealth all day long. They're they're fighting over a smaller prize, you could say. And that's a good thing. I think this is a point I think is important for us to draw out because it shows that when there's less at stake, yeah, they aren't quite as bloody. Some of them don't even want to be king. You have more examples of, I don't really want this responsibility Mm -hmm. because it is more responsibility without as much of the luxury. If it's responsibility and luxury, well, then you get people that really want that luxury and that power. But if you take take it away, you try to make it more about just the responsibility, then hopefully you only get people that want it. The problem with that is it's still monarchy or system of (laughs) inheritance where you're not really picking people (laughs) you're just they just kind of inherit i I thought it was important to take a note of how the farther back in history we're going to go today for the most part there's less murders like the way the anarchy was resolved was they just were done fighting they they had been at it for so long neither leader was killed most of all their children had survived for decades even under these conditions of war uh, they had an agreement. Okay, look, Stephen, you get to stay king, but when you're done, y- Matilda's children are next. So she doesn't become queen, but Stephen's kids never inherit. And they didn't really care that much. One of them was mad about it. The eldest, the one who was actually going to become king, Eustace, he was kind of mad about it. He went off and started at ravaging church lands and died while ravaging. It's like real karmic. Like this guy actually died while ravaging church lands. And of course, Christian era, they're like, God struck him down, you know. <laughs> but then the other brothers were just like, okay, that's it. We're done. If that scenario had happened three, four hundred, five hundred years before that, they probably would have just kept going. Probably would have gone for another generation or it would have been like the Hundred Years War that had raged before that or something like that. I think that's really interesting that War, yes, devastation to the countryside, mass amounts of citizens suffered horribly. That's not exactly our focus today. It's important, but um, the family side, mm, we're sort of polite to each other as much as you can be in terms of war. They found a way to settle it, but it still goes to show where their selfishness lies. They weren't really concerned with the people. They were really just concerned with getting what they could. And then when that didn't happen after multiple decades, they finally, finally compromised after decades. So yeah, mm, not good. And I think that's where we put the accent. That's why we're putting the accent on family, because we understand that people killing each other, there is 
you know, we've seen it time and time again that people sometimes do to selfishness. They don't exactly think of some random person out there on the same level as they think of their loved ones. So they're like, eh, it's kind of like that Orson Welles movie, right? You know, imagine that a bunch of those people that look like dots from high above disappear and you make a ton of money. Does that really bother you? And you're like, eh, they are a statistic. But I think the point that it gets interesting is where we move from that level, which again, it's not like it's, oh, that's acceptable because according to modern sensitivity, we would still look at it as fairly horrible and monstrous. But nonetheless, a level that we can understand a little more to the family level where you're literally your reign rest on the corpses of all your family members, that takes it to a whole other level because it's like if you don't trust and love your family members, do you trust and love anybody? Yeah. And in many cases, you see that these guys do not. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're going to see examples later as we go where it's not just, you know, brothers killing brothers, but it's like, uh, people killing their spouse or their own kids or things where it's like, can you possibly have any love left anywhere in your life? Or is it all about power and nothing else? And every single person in the world, including the ones close to you, is just a threat to your domination. And that's all that you ever understand. Because that seems to be the case. And it's Harder to process because at some point you start wondering, power for what? Mm. Because, you know, if you have all the power in the world, but if you have absolutely no one that you can trust, is that even power? Is there even something remotely worth chasing in this power if you sacrifice every human relationship you ever could possibly have in the name of it? That's a really a good thing that House of the Dragon does really well. It starts off with the friendship between the two girls uh, to show what gets destroyed. It it really does try to show what this pursuit of power does to you on a personal level. These people, you see them being pretty decent, happy, like relatively, you know, they're royals, they're isolated, they're not normal, but they have these human qualities that you just mentioned that apparently you have to murder those within yourself before you can go murder other people, especially if they're people that you used to love or have affection for, or at least have a sense that doing this would be wrong. You have to murder that sense of wrongness within you and murder that sense of what did you kill within yourself to become this? And once it's dead, you're not getting it back either. It's as dead as the people you murdered, that goodness within you. So yeah, I think we it is really well portrayed. You see Alicent she doesn't want to do any of this. She doesn't want to have to achieve these things because she knows what it means. And she's constantly trying to push back against the idea that there's only one way. It's like, no, surely we can find a compromise. Surely we don't have to go to war. Surely my father didn't want his own daughter wiped out here. I mean, come on, y'all. We, we can find a compromise. She's just pleading. The pleas fall on deaf ears, but to the audience, they sound very rational. They sound like very human things to do. But I, I suspect the farther along she goes this notion of trying to hold on to her humanity to cling to something decent is going to be harder and harder for her to do as the blood, you know, starts flowing and more and more deaths pile up. I mean, is she going to still feel that way if one of her children dies? How is Rhaenyra going to feel now that one of her children's dead? I mean, there's these things, they, just like you said, the family member aspect becomes very personal on both ends. A, how can this family member betray me like this? B, it's the person you love most in the world someone else killed them that becomes your biggest enemy yeah yeah in fact that's once you start going down that path it gets progressively easier to go down that path yeah is that initial momentum that's like it's a huge jump but yes of course if the other people make the first move and kill someone close to you well all bets are off all that discussion has uh, disappeared and it's interesting because as we were saying you know you see it in the distant past you see, I was looking at an example just from basically the other day, historically, just in the 1800s. You know, Shaka Zulu was uh, the king of the Zulu kingdom from 1816 to 1828. So we're only talking about 200 years, you know, really not much. And the same exact story replays, right? It's like Shaka Zulu achieves power by murdering his own brother, who was the legitimate next in line to the throne. Then uh, a couple of his half-brothers try to kill him. Eventually, they will succeed in killing him, partially because Shogaz was a curious character, to say the least. (laughs) There are reels, and again, who knows what's real and what's not. Maybe some of these were spread by his enemies later to justify the killing or what. 
but like there's a story that when his mother died, Shaka Zulu really lost a few steps and started doing, you know, he ordered no crops to be planted for a year, what? which is <laughs> of a problem because you're going to starve a bunch of people. That's pretty bad. He didn't allow milk to be used and milk was central to the Zulu diet. He, uh, he supposedly, and again, this is getting to a point where he's like, come on, man, is this real or what? But there supposedly he passed the thing that for a year of mourning, any woman who became pregnant was to be killed along with her husband. What? Um, so, you know, it could be that Ooh, he may have gone insane. I just end up killing my brother. I start making up stories about him, say, hey, did you see? I had to kill him. You see what a crazy bastard he was? But uh, who knows? In any case, the story, yeah, he gets murdered just the same way as he had murdered the brother before him to achieve power. And then, I mean, it gets almost comical, and I don't want to, especially I don't want to get into all the names and stuff because it gets highly complicated, but, you know, the guy who comes after him gets killed by his brother. Of course. The guy who comes after him starts murdering all his brothers to get them out of the way as possible rivals. That's why I actually like the title Game of Thrones, because it does feel like a game. You know, it does feel like there's this weird game being played in the name of power that uh, repeat itself over and over again. And the Zulu story, again, it's such a different context, right? You know, we look at Persia a minute ago. Uh, now you look at the depth of Africa, as south as it gets, and you still find clearly not exactly a lot of cultural contact there, but same dynamics play out so more than 2,000 years later. Same thing. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So that's another it? one. That you look at it, you're like, huh. Some societies are more similar to one another than uh, it's not just by diffusion of some ideas. Some independently end up in the same spot. Well, one thing that I find interesting about this, too, is that as the power grows, as these kingdoms grow, and this is something that works itself out along human history, the farther back you go, the smaller the kingdoms are. You know, you get to the point where the kingdoms are uh, what we would call in Westeros petty kingdoms, and then they become larger kingdoms and eventually start to get empires. And of course, there's rises and falls, and some of the largest kingdoms were in the ancient world or empires. Different kingdoms are run different ways over time, as we said. But yeah, the, uh, one th another thing that continues throughout history, no matter what region, what country you go to, is power seeks power. When you're a royal, you want to marry other royals. And there aren't a lot of other royals. There are no other royals in your own country if you've killed them all. <laughs> so, and you don't want to necessarily imbue someone else with royal blood within your own culture because that immediately makes your family uh a possible target later down the line from their family. The system of monarchy in that it allows only people of a certain bloodline to rule. That can go both ways in that the few that have it are the only ones that can rule. But that also means that anyone else who acquires it, A, is either at risk of being killed because they're a threat, or B, it becomes is a threat to the others that have it. And this gets used both ways. Let's uh, take an example from the Viking Age. The thrones of Denmark and Norway. A lot of these names are going to be familiar to y'all if you've watched the show Vikings. Some of the coolest names come from the Viking world. So Norway's first king was Harold Finehair or Harold Fairhair. Both nicknames are, are considered possible what he was called. He's in part mythical like a lot of early kings and legends like Romulus and Remus and people like that. A lot of the stuff is some history to it, some myth to it. So it, not not super important to figure out which is which at this point, but his great-grandfather was Sigurd, snake in the eye, thus he would be a great-great-grandson of Ragnar Lothbrok. He had a lot of sons, Harold Finehair, with multiple wives. He had Halfdan the Black, Halfdan the White, Bjorn the Tradesman, Eric Bloodaxe, Hakon the Good. King Harold married Eric Bloodaxe to Gunhild, who was daughter of Gorm the Old, and Gorm the Old was the king of Denmark. So you get the king of first king of Norway, he takes his son, uh, one of his sons and marries to the daughter of the king of Denmark, right? Gorm the Old was the son of Canute I. Canute I was grandson of Sigurd Snake in the Eye. So he's great-grandson of Ragnar Lothbrok. So both of the king of Denmark and Norway can trace their family recently to Ragnar Lothbrok through the same son of Ragnar, Sigurd Snake in the Eye. So they're already all family. So in this semi-legendary state of the early Viking Age, we already have mingled bloodlines from both kingdoms here <laughs> and from 
prehistory. Eric uh, inherited because Gunhild, daughter of Gorm the Old, was a boss of a princess, and she had at least eight children, and she got a Daenerys-type title, Gunhild, Mother of Kings. She poisoned Halfdan the Black so that her husband Eric could become the heir. Eric inherited and then immediately killed four of his other brothers, including Bjorn the Tradesman and probably Halfdan the White, but not hack on the good who survived and eventually overthrew Eric. King Harold apparently also ordered Eric Bloodax to kill one of his own one of his other brothers, which is his own son. So that's like this is a different time. <laughs> you have a guy saying, "Hey son, kill my other son, your brother." I'm like, wow. Anyway, Bloodax went over to England and became king of Northumbria cuz he can do that, I guess. <laughs> One of his daughters married the son of Thorfinn Skullsplitter, Earl of Orkney, where she convinced her... Right? Cool-ass name, right? Where she convinced her husband to kill his own brother. And then again. And then again. So she married the three different sons of Thorfinn Skullsplitter and each time convinced them to kill one of the others. She was apparently cool with the fourth one, though. The fourth brother, she's like, okay, this is the guy. This is the cool one. <laughs> so she stuck with him and they had kids and she got the nickname female spider, which I don't know why they need to specify gender. You could just say spider and that would have worked. But anyway, but Eric Bloodaxe's sons were not happy with this turn of affairs. Eric was happy with his kingdom in Northumbria. They're like, no, we want to go get the kingdom of Norway back from Uncle Hakon. And so we may as well call these the Blood Axe Rebellions uh, in reference to the Blackfire Rebellions from the Targaryen cadet dynasty that tried to overthrow the Targaryens. In 955 and 957, they attacked. Each of the first two times, one of the sons was killed. The third time, Gorm the Old helped his grandchildren trying to uh, try to win this battle. And he, they still lost. And then the next year, Gorm died. And he passed the throne to Harold Bluetooth. So Harold Bluetooth... And Harold Finehair. We got all these Harolds here. Is somebody who invented some technology early on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So he had a leg up on the game because of his wireless technology in the Viking Age. Yes. really gave him an edge there. <laughs> so in 961, the fourth try, another attack. They lost again, but Hakon was wounded. So Uncle Hakon dies of his wounds, the ultimate Pyrrhic victory. Harold Greycloak, eldest of the living blood axe sons, becomes king of Norway. So another Harold. Yeah, so the, the, you have Harold Greycloak, king of Norway, Harold Bluetooth, king of Denmark. And then he immediately sets about murdering other local rulers, and notably two other grandsons of Harold Finehair, so his cousins. And then he burns to death Hakon's friend Sigurd in an inn. Sigurd had a son named Hakon, probably because he was best friends with King Hakon. So <laughs> Sigurd and Harold Bluetooth team up to murder Harold Greycloak so that Harold Bluetooth can now become king of both Denmark and Norway. So it was one of those there can be only one Harold situation. Mm -hmm. So an uncle and a nephew, the uncle kills the nephew and Sigurd becomes one of his vassals. And I mean, this all happens in like eight years, all this stuff. And what does this tell you? It tells you that having the claim can go both ways. It can make you the king, but can also make you a target. Harold Bluetooth was like, mm, if I kill him, I'm immediately mm -hmm. king of Denmark and king of Norway. Yep. Boom, just like that. And who's going to stop me? I'm the king of Norway. And then if I do that, I'll be king of Denmark. So yeah, just sibling rivalry and sibling loyalty that's the other thing Daniele. it might strike you that the blood axe brothers all stayed loyal to each other even after they won two of his brothers were joint kings with harold Greycloak, his, and he kept them he didn't kill them they yep. ruled so after all this betrayal and murder two of his brothers were still cool with him and there was no problem they ran off and were never heard from again when their older brother was killed so you really have a both cases here you have claims on both sides you have familial loyalty and extreme familial disloyalty and i'm not sure that it's easy to parse especially you know 1400 years later what's what like why certain brothers maybe just regular human reasons they got along they were raised together and the stuff we expect like those were the yeah. normal ones i think <laughs> so they're the, they're the exceptions Pretty good example. Yeah, that is interesting because um, having a story that has both is fascinating because that clearly shows you that there are culture can push you one way or another, 
but it's not going to determine fully these choices. Because otherwise, yeah, these other brothers could have killed their guy and kept the cycle going. But in that case, these people didn't, even in a context in which people had done stuff like that. So it's uh, it still shows you that at the end of the day, humans, human individuality plays a role in this. It's not purely larger forces that manipulate all human beings like they are pawns in the game. Culture definitely shape us, but it doesn't determine all our choices. Yeah. And I think that's where it gets interesting. Yeah, you're totally right. And just as a footnote to show how this all escalates even more and how it grows into the modern age or, or into another portion of history that eventually becomes a modern age. We talk about how these kingdoms grow from smaller and smaller and larger and larger. And the bloodlines that are inheriting these are inheriting progressively larger and larger amounts of power or at least have more and more claims out there in the world because they have more and more family connections. For example, it's fitting karmically that Harold Bluetooth was overthrown by his own son, Swain Forkbeard, the first Scandinavian king of England, who, who added England to Denmark and Norway. And his son, Canute the Great, ended up calling it the North Sea Empire and really locked it down into something that held for a while. One of Canute's daughters married the Holy Roman Emperor. And actually, mm -hmm. not related, but fun and worth mention is that that daughter had to have her honor defended in an actual trial by combat. <laughs> which she won <laughs> or, or her champion won yeah so viking stories you never go wrong <laughs> right it's just too cool this is the same family that eventually led to harold hardrada and all these other great characters and it just keeps going so as history plod on these royals are just connected to a larger number of countries and they have claims to a larger number of places and monarchy just got more and more fraught <laughs> the more time passed because of these these uh, dangling threads of power that anyone with a claim could start to pull on if they had enough power and wealth and ambition. Absolutely. Smile brilliant. Stop the expensive guess and test method when it comes to teeth whitening and oral care. They sent me a package. They send you the teeth impression kit where you get a very precise measurement of your teeth and then they send you the whitening kit that will measure very precisely, not just some one size fits all thing. It is for your specific mouth and that is an important thing because so many whitening products miss spots. And the, really, the only good way to get everything is to have a custom fit. That's uh, apparently what dentists will tell you. LED lights are a novelty item. They're not really that helpful. They can actually increase tooth sensitivity. That's not what you're looking for. You want whiter teeth, not more sensitive teeth, right? If you feel like you have to have more sensitive teeth to get whiter teeth, well, apparently that is not the case. Strips neglect gum lines. Charcoal is abrasive. Whitening toothpaste is only moderately effective. It doesn't really get below the tooth line. It's only surface stains. So the number one product recommended by dentists is the custom fitted tray. It used to be really expensive, $300 to $1,000, but that is no longer the case. Prices have dropped dramatically. 10 years ago, Smile Brilliant started doing this. Their innovative lab direct process has cut down on that cost significantly. It still kind of depends on specifics for you. But if you sign up through our link, you will save at least 20% if you use the code Westeros or Westeros5. If they already have a site-wide sale, it'll add to that sale. So either Westeros or Westeros5 to save extra money on your Smile Brilliant purchase. Check it out. Get whiter teeth. I think it's interesting that, you know, we talk about the historical examples and there are many and we're going to go through a few more. As well as, uh, you know, not only Game of Thrones, of course, or everything that Gerard Martin has been writing, but you look, you look at Shakespeare, like King Lear, it's that story, right? And yeah. then incidentally, for people who have never seen it, there's a fantastic movie by legendary Japanese director Akira Kurosawa called uh, Ran. And Ran is a Japanese version of the King Lear story. And there's this famous one that uh, supposedly is an anecdote that I'm sure is not the only guy who ever did it. But there's supposedly a Mongol story that's tied to this about this breaking of the arrow that then Shakespeare used, that then Kurosawa used, and this, this idea that like when somebody's trying to, this father who's trying to convince his kid to work together, and he uses this bundle of arrows showing like one arrow, I can snap it like this. But when all these arrows are together, now I can no longer snap it. Great and there's this famous scene in Iran where the, one of the sons that supposedly could be loyal to the oldest decided screw this, goes up to the father, grab the bundle of arrows, 
bend them on his knee and snap them anyway. So <laughs> He's like, oh, I can snap that. That's hilarious. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a funny thing because, you know, you see the attempt of the older generation to say, hey, guys, play nice, please. Yeah. And one of them say, yeah, not going to happen. That's just not. And, you know, supposedly, I heard this story as a Mongol story that supposedly something that was tied the way to Genghis Khan. Um, again, probably is not, it's not exactly a single original concept. You under, I don't think anybody who's been around arrows long enough understand <laughs> that one, but it's easy and several don't. But like, and with the Mongols, same thing. You know, with the Mongols, it didn't work. If anything, that's one of the big what ifs of history. What if the Mongols had managed to keep their empire united? Oof. What if they had not, and not even for that long, just for a couple generations longer? How far would they have gone? Because these guys conquer pretty much all of East Asia, most of Southeast Asia, most of the Middle East, uh, ended up conquering big chunks, of, let's not even mention Russia, but even big chunks of Europe, even knocking at the door of Western Europe, fighting as far west as Austria. They made it to Palestine, like what the area that's today, Israel slash Palestine, all that area, they made it all the way there. They made they got into fights with the Egyptian military. I mean, they were conquering everything there was. Didn't mean they won every battle, because, like, for example, the Egyptian didn't work. There were a few as they were stretching the empire. But they conquered a humongous amount of land in an extremely short amount of time. And the thing that in many ways prevented them from doing even more so was the fact that they started fighting with each other. And some of these is post Genghis Khan, but some of this is not, because, you know, before being Genghis Khan, when he was still uh, Temujin, that was his name, uh, there's a tale that even though technically he was the next in line to be chief of this small Mongolian tribe, they had lost power after his father had been murdered by enemies. So he was inheriting nothing, really. And yet, even then, there was an argument between brothers, and Temujin, one of his brothers, killed one of their other brothers. So again, these bloody family rivalries could blow up even on nothing. And then, you know, he keeps it together, but within a couple of generations, the way where things really break down is where you have uh, Kublai Khan, who was a uh, grandson, and, uh, and one of his brothers, Arik Boke, who are going to have it when, uh, after the death of a previous Khan, are going to get into the giant civil war, fight one another, eventually Kublai triumphs. He's hesitant about openly killing his brother. Again, this is a culture where I guess it's a little more frowned upon. <laughs> so he just keeps him in prison. And oh, look at that. He died in prison. Oh. What a what a tragedy. I don't know how it happened. You know? <laughs> who, who knows? That was so strange. You know, but yet, even though he wins the civil war, by that point, the united Mongolian power is broken. And now you have different uh, different states that emerge from this one giant empire, never really to be reunited again. So they may cooperate culturally or diplomatically, but they are never going to be politically and militarily united again in a way that can threaten everyone else. This example of the brothers is really interesting how they work together. I want to focus on that just a little longer. The examples where the brothers work together, another one... It, going back to the Vikings briefly, the Sons of Ragnar are semi-legendary again, and the show portrayed them sort of warring against each other a little bit. But for the most part, in real life, they were united, or at least didn't war against each other. They went in different directions and didn't fight each other so much. So there are, and in, like you said, a lot of Genghis's sons didn't fight each other, but his grandchildren did. It's almost like you need someone to teach that. That has to be imparted to people, but you don't need to teach them to kill and survive and, and to teach them to lust after power. You maybe need to teach them not to. But that's the thing that just happens. No one needs to teach that. So it is maybe something to make you a little cynical that <laughs> like like a lot of human things, education is what we need. Teaching them when they're young is what you need to do to keep them from doing this. And if it's not done, there's nothing you can do about it after a certain point. Once it devolves, like you said, once that path is on, once you're killing, once brothers are killing each other, it's not something that's to say, oh, wait, what are we doing? Let's stop. That's one of those things sure. that once it's going, it's going. It's like a oh, boulder yeah. rolling yeah. downhill. You know, you can't just turn it off. You can't just say, actually, let's back that up. Well, that's why most problems are solved most effectively by prevention, not by trying to fix them when they are already in the middle of drama. You know, if you 
think about anything in human life, right? If you people in a relationship, if you are, if you get through a hundred fights, even if you learn how to communicate more effectively, now there are so many wounds from the past that it's going to be way harder to communicate effectively when there's all these raw emotions that, you know, wounds that have never really been healed. Yeah, bitterness, uh, resentment, yeah, et cetera. Just expectations that it will happen again. Yeah, just, just yep, thinking yep. that it'll never work, things like that. Yeah, these yep. things on the na national scale, on the royal scale, yeah. And the bitterness can be a lot more intense and... The, the, the paranoia can be more intense when, you know, if you're talking, I, I think using a regular relationship like you just did is a fantastic example, but usually that's not a matter of life and death, but you're adding that sure. into the mix and you can see how much more fraught and, and terrifying it can get and how much people can really just get in their own minds about what other people are thinking. It's like, oh, surely they're going to come for me, you know, <laughs> or surely they're not going to come for me <laughs> less less of that probably <laughs> only the I naive think, ones uh, like that yeah you know if you spend enough time in divorce courts you start <laughs> seeing what happens <laughs> within family <laughs> with people and uh and it gets nasty you know? <laughs> it, it really gets, does uh, people who are used to love each other and it doesn't quite work that way anymore and it's and that's i think where some of those examples do come up that I find even more disturbing because it's like, okay, it's disturbing enough that you're willing to kill a bunch of people to have power. It takes it several layers up where you kill your own siblings to have power. When it gets to even people who are murdering their spouses, their kids, I mean, when you get to murder your own kids, I think that's when already probably you want to draw the line there. Yeah. There's a, one of those that I dug up on as an example. There's the story of the Roman emperor Constantine, where Constantine is considered, if I remember correctly, still considered a saint by the Eastern Orthodox Church. It uh, definitely has a very privileged uh, role with the history of Christianity because he's the guy that not only made Christianity uh, no longer illegal, but actually makes it to the official religion of the empire, mm. you know, and start pushing in the direction. So it's a huge transformation pushing in that direction. So, you know, he's considered this uh, saintly figure within, at least in the history written by Christian sources. But when you look at his story, there are so many disturbing aspects. And I won't even get into, you know, killing uh, his co emperor or scenes where I'm like, okay, well, that was far for the course. <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, there's one anecdote that supposedly, and again, we don't know much about it because most of the historians who came afterwards decided that it was a wise idea not to address that topic because Constantine or his descendants may decide to take it poorly. But uh, Constantine was married to uh, the empress who was named Fausta. And Fausta, the only thing we know is that at some point, Constantine gets the notion that she has it for him, and he has her boiled alive. And uh, while we are at it, also had his eldest son uh, executed. Again, supposedly because maybe both of them were in cahoots to get rid of Constantine, so they're husband for one and father for the other. Who knows what really happened. You, the only thing we know is that he did he does kill his son and his wife. And again, you're like, wow, mm. that's a little, that's taking it another notch up. Yeah. Because, you know, one of the things that most people do, I mean, even like the lion example you made earlier in nature, you know, it's like you have this competition with other male lions, you have a competition with maybe you the one who even key, take over a pride and kill the children of the previous male lion, that kind of thing. But a primary drive is people have more than anything else to protect their kids. You know, it's like even the ones who are murdering left, right, and center, they, are, they want their kids to be safe. I mean, that's kind of one of the themes in House of the Dragons, right? There's this yeah. whole idea of like, oh, I got to do it to protect my kids. This is taking it to the next level, where it's like, nope, your kids are a possible enemy. Your spouse is a possible enemy. Nobody you can trust. And if they give an inkling that they are not 100% loyal to you, and again, what have you done for your kids and your wife not to be what to be loyal yeah, to? Yeah, right? So that's... Uh... 
that's a tricky one yeah. to say the least. You hear about that with these modern drug kingpins, like we hear about the case of uh, El Chapo, who was mm-hmm. spied on all of his own family members, even his wife and his kids. He listened on their phone calls. He was so paranoid about anyone turning him in, or wow. just. And I think a lot of it is the nature of the system he was in. Not to, yeah. of course, I'm not. I don't have sympathy for him, but I'm just saying yeah. that the system that he he didn't build the system of of the war on drugs and the addictions that people have and the amount of money people spend on that. He certainly capitalized on it as much as about anyone ever has, but like he achieved all his goals as a drug kingpin yet. Like there's no chance this man was happy if he's spying on his wife and children because he's worried about what they'll do to him about it. Are they going to throw me in jail? Like it's super hard to, even attempt to wrap your head around that mindset. For one thing, I I don't even have children, so I can't imagine spying on them, but I can't imagine having a billion dollars. I can't imagine all the people I would have had to kill to get to that, to all the crimes I would have had to commit, all the awful things I would have had to do to get to that point. So talk about a person who is about as different as I can imagine. Well, there you go. Like, And that applies to a lot of these people we're talking about, whether it's El Chapo or... Mm-hmm. or Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan or Shaka Zulu or Emperor Nero or whoever. Yeah, these are or Scar the Lion, you know, it just <laughs> we just it's really it is really hard to when we say, well, how do humans behave? When you think about this, it's just really just emphasizes the breadth and depth of the human experience and how different it can be and how just I have no yeah. idea what these people were thinking or feeling. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, just for fun, I'll throw you the last of my examples that I have on these stories that fits these uh, family things. This is a trippy one. Again, just for the sake of variety, I'm going to different places geographically. So this one comes from Japan in the late 1500s, early 1600s, which is the end of the Sengoku period, where long period of civil war that started over a hundred years earlier where these different warlords emerged trying to uh, unify Japan under their rule. There was the, the three, you know, you had uh, Oda Nobunaga who was the first one, the kind of the unifier, and he was again another one of these guys who you read horrific stories, one after another, after another. Oh, yeah. Um, you had uh, Hideyoshi was the second one and you have the guy who actually comes up on top at the end was uh, Tokugawa you know Yasu Tokugawa was the guy who will be who initially start out as a minor player but will progressively gain power now check out this story about Tokugawa ah, this is where things get fun so <laughs> Tokugawa right. is married he has kids and all of that and um one of his kids, his oldest son, was actually married to a daughter of Nobunaga when Nobunaga was still alive. So, you know, he arranged a powerful marriage for his son. So basically Nobunaga's daughter, his, uh, his daughter-in-law, so they are intimately tied, right? The problem, <laughs> there always is, <laughs> is that um, Ieyasu's wife, kind of get into the mix of the marriage a bit too much. Supposedly, you know, the Tokugawa's son and uh, Nobunaga's daughter are very much in love with one another. But one problem is that they cannot, they can't seem to have a son. They keep popping out daughters one after another and they don't have a son. And that's kind of a problem. So the mom of this guy decide to intervene by starting to push concubines on her son <laughs> to say, well, you know, you need to make a boy at some point. This lady, I'm glad you're in love with her, but you don't really seem to be to be able to pop out a son, so let's try with a different lady. So what happens is that this woman does not take it well. The daughter-in-law decide, I'm going to call daddy because everybody's scared of my father, Oda Nobunaga. So she sent a message saying, you know what? I think this lady, my mother-in-law, she may be conspiring against you. Yeah, (laughs) She wasn't, but it's a way to kind of... It's believable. Yeah, and he goes like, oh, really? Is she? So he sends a letter to his ally, 
uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu saying, hey, I hear your wife is not so fond of me. What's going on there? You know, my daughter tells me there are problems. Tokugawa, who knows that his wife is completely innocent of this, immediately has her executed. He's like, oh, you know, well, of course, I want to show you my loyalty. You know, clearly, if there's even a oh suspicion my that my wife is disloyal yeah. to you, off with her head. It gets better. At that point, he turns then to his son and say, now, I know your mom was innocent. I know you are innocent and 100% loyal to me. However, of course, you are, you know, your mom got executed. You are honor and duty bound to avenge her. And clearly, I can't have that. So, sorry, son, it's time for you to commit seppuku and uh, shove some steel in your guts and disembowel yourself because can't have that. Clearly the right way to the resolve it. The in law in the meantime is like, wait, what? That's not what I wanted. I just wanted to get rid of my mother-in-law. I was perfectly in love with my husband. And he's like, I didn't mean it that way. But, you know, it spiraled out of control just a tiny bit. So the guy executed both his wife and his son because of a completely non-existent suspicion of disloyalty to the boss. Jeez, that's incredible. That's incredible. Okay. You, well, it really underscores just how why they'd be so paranoid. Because if you have an imagination, imagine having a an imagination and living in a situation like you'd be so easy to come up with a scenario where someone put you in the crosshairs and made you well, either uh, made you look like the bad guy or actually just straight up murdered you. Yeah, there's so many. Yeah, that's uh, from, uh, the North Korean stories, right? He's like, uh, he was the first one to stop clapping at the speed. <laughs> I yeah, think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to question this guy's loyalty at this point. Yeah, he, he's not paranoia. That's re- that's legitimate, right? They really are killing people for yeah. <laughs> little things like that. And, and it's interesting to think too. Occasionally, there's like a an oversight. Usually, there isn't. Almost never. Almost usually, there's no oversight because they're fighting for the top spot. They are fighting to be the overseer, the one that would give out any punishments. The ultimate, the king, you know, giver yeah. of laws. So if you win the crown, then you also escape the consequences that you accrued while on this path to take the crown. So in Europe, for a while, there was a little bit of a different scenario, which is which helps to explain why, say, the anarchy, um, while terrible towards the common folk, why the royals were and nobles were sort of better behaved than what we would see 500,000 years ago. And the difference is religion. They actually thought the Pope would excommunicate them if they went too far. Now, of course, that's fraught with politics and different popes behaved differently. Some of them encouraged war. Some of them took bribes. Some political favors were passed all back and forth. But it was, but there were more rules. Let's put it that way. The rules mm-hmm. weren't, weren't always the best, but there was less killing and murdering because of these rules are like, no, I don't want to be kicked out of the church. So there actually was sort of a, a governing body above the, the, the crown at that point. That's kind of unique because throughout most history, emperor slash king, whoever, whatever culture you're in, almost always also is like the head priest at the same time. Yep. They are both like the title of king also is like the when Julius Caesar was named you know, dictator or when uh, Augustus was named emperor, he was also chief priest. Uh, the the king of England is not the head of the church. That's the Pope. It's that's, that's a separate thing. But the king of say Macedonia, one of our final examples is the head chief priest as well as the head lawmaker and head war leader. So it's often forgotten that the king is actually the head of everything in a lot of these cultures, but it is uh, an exception when there's a, a powerful religious organization whose beliefs and cultural influence is powerful. In Westeros, that's a thing, right? We, we talked about kin slaying. That is a taboo. Um, there's no one that, there's no kin slaying police that's, that are going to come out and get you if you kin slayed, but it can be used to stir up public uh, opinion against someone who did it. And certain religious beliefs say that, well, yeah, you're going to, the gods will come for you. And so, you know, like if you're the guy who wants to take the crown from someone that was a kinslayer, you can say, oh, uh, the gods want me to do this. And some people will probably join you because of that. But for the most part, the winner, it is a winner take all situation. You get all the prizes and you, you are removed from all consequences. And so if we go far back enough in time, we can find times where it wasn't very taboo. It was acceptable. It was just like, 
well, yeah, of course you kill your brother. If you don't, he might take your power. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, well, it's evil to kill your brother, but I kind of understand. No, it was just, yeah, do what you need to do. Kill your brother, kill your father. You got to do it. You got to do it. There may have been, it may have been frowned upon, but we're talking, that's the extent of it. Like, oh, you sh- naughty boy, you, you know? <laughs> it was, it's not like, oh, the gods will condemn you. I mean, there's, there's exceptions there, but for the most part, yeah, not so much. Monarchy is a real great system, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's where it gets, I mean, we could go on with examples from here to forever, but I think we made our point as far as these being something that shows up in many different parts of the world, in many different cultures, some of the same dynamics apply. This is not to say in all cultures, because I think that's one of the points I want to make eventually. But like, if we shift from specific examples to some of the conclusions that we can draw from this kind of discussions, I mean, one of the things that I find fascinating is that here we are talking about emperors and kings and the most powerful people in the world. Literally, they are doing all of what they are doing in the name for a quest for power. And yet, in some way, it's fascinating to see the very richest and most powerful human being actually being slaves to the game they are they have built and actually having very limited choices. Yeah. You know, we see the paranoia where you can't trust anybody. You essentially are condemned to lives without love, pretty much, because, of course, love cannot exist where paranoia rules and you are afraid of everybody and you are willing to boil alive your wife and execute your son or something like that you know so you're you're living lives in which you are a slave to a game that brings you what happiness can it possibly bring you you know it's like a when you live a life where you don't trust anyone where i mean you know we're talking about the past and emperors but even think about like uh, there's a famous example of uh, back in, I forget if it was the 60s, the 70s, there was this Getty kidnapping where one of the heir of the Getty family was kidnapped in Italy. And this uh, grandfather who was insanely wealthy, one of the wealthiest people around, didn't want to pay the ransom. And then when eventually they chop off his grandson ear saying, hey, we are serious, please pay the ransom. He agreed to a ransom that was a very, I forget the exact amount. It was a very peculiar number, and it was the maximum that he could illegally detract from taxes for a situation like that. (laughs) Yes, because kidnapping ransoms are uh, are part of the tax code, yeah. (laughs) And then that money, he lent it to his son so that he could uh, rescue the grandson at a 4% interest. Ugh. Oh my God. And he was, this was a guy that they say that if you went to his house, even as a family member, there was a payphone where you had to put coins in if you wanted to make a call. Jeez. This is a guy who lived an old man in the world for generations to come and clearly did not have a loving bone in his body where he just didn't like his own family, didn't trust his own family, wouldn't lift a finger for. And so you're like. Wow, that's taking, or I mean, forget the, think about the obvious, speaking of slave to the game, something that you do see in all the Game of Thrones story, you do see in history over and over, the richest and most powerful you are, the less you have any say so regarding who you're going to marry. Yeah, yeah, whether you, even as you have the power, you weaken yourself, but some of your choices just are are eliminated based on... Yep the the house you've built around you yeah uh, yeah if you don't marry and the right person mind. the whole house collapses yeah right and in the name of these not only then you start moving into arranged marriages where you have to marry somebody you don't even know because hey, it's a powerful alliance kind of shit but then you get into also things like well why don't we solidify power a little more why don't you marry your own brother or why don't you marry your sister or why don't you ma- like Flat out encouraging incest, which again, for most human beings in the world, they cannot pay you enough money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you insane? What are we talking about here? <laughs> and it becomes what the most powerful people in the world are forced to do, where you don't have a choice. So we are going to marry. We you may even marry somebody who's uh, 50 years older than you or a sibling or something. And so it becomes ridiculous because at 
you know, you understand the struggle for power in the name that, oh, I have power, so I have uh, greater freedom of choice. And then you realize that these people do not have greater freedom of choice. They have fancier toys. They have, uh, but if anything, their freedom of choice is shrank by playing this game for power. So in that sense, it's not even a game for power because power would be actually have more say so over your life. More of a voice regarding it's power over you others. Are. You you give up. It's like you give up power over yourself to have power over yeah. others. Almost, yeah. Like that's the anti. Yeah, everybody <laughs> becomes a slave to the game, including you. Yeah, you know? and and that's yeah. fascinating as well because I think when you look at power, you can almost say that it's it's specifically not just ever. It's not just that you become a slave to power. It's specifically that you sacrifice the the parts of you that are the most human like a love yeah. of your siblings or your family is one of the most basic positive things of that that exists and yeah. th almost every example we've laid out today is an example where you can't trust your family or you can maybe only trust a few of them and even those maybe you can only trust so far and having that just it makes the most opposite things normal the most normal things of human existence that most people experience family and and children and marriage all those things these things are all become marriages become leverage uh, your children become enemies or or pawns for someone else um your friends are allies are not really friends and allies that's a different thing and and allies circumstances can change allegiances their alliance to you is rooted in what it does for their power, not what it does for their personality, not how much they like to hang around you or value your friendship. And this is why I think we saved maybe the most, um, most stunning set of examples for last because it's the oldest. Now there's other examples. And as Daniele and I talked about, the system has a lot to do with, how these things work. You go back far enough to like Egyptian pharaohs. There weren't a lot of pharaohs murdering each other. Part of that maybe mm -hmm. because of religious belief, the pharaoh was considered like a direct conduit to the gods and killing that is it's pretty taboo. There's some things even the quest for power will will make people think twice about if your beliefs in, in higher powers are, su are sufficiently deep rooted. But yeah, so what I wanted to talk about briefly was Macedonia. Because it encapsulates as well so many of the things we talked about, and it concludes with an example that is just the most stunning example to me of flipping normal on its head. All right. So from the book Antigonus One Eye by Jeff Champion, quote, periods of stability in Macedonian history were rare. Unpopular kings were often assassinated, hunting accidents being a popular method. Game of Thrones fans will be familiar with the hunting accident. All too often, the death of one king was followed by a bout of civil war with rival claimants competing for the throne. In the succession of kings, primogeniture was usual, but not always practiced. Pyrrhus, the king of Epirus, described the reality. When asked by one of his three sons who should inherit the throne, he replied, To the one of you who keeps his sword the sharpest. This was the famous curse of Oedipus, the legendary king of Thebes, that thrones should be won by the sword and not inherited by order of birth. So what this says, we have both of these main elements are aligned to create the ultimate bloody system. A, their personal situation and scenario demands it like it does in so many other cultures that it's kill or be killed. But it's reinforced by their own myths and legends. Oedipus of the founding, the legendary king of Thebes, this story that's told to so many different children across ancient Greece. They're told that this is normal, that brothers killing brothers is not just normal, but expected. Not just normal, but expected. It's what you're supposed to do, right? So that's, wow. And it took a, centuries of pushback of people saying, no. This isn't our natural state. Like killing each other is bad, man. We got to we got to put a stop to this because someone say Plato, Plato himself of all people. He lived in Athens, not Macedonia. He could say whatever he wanted about the Macedonians and he had a strong opinion and he had a lot of data. Plato died early in the reign of Philip, Alexander the Great's father. It's Philip II. But Plato lived through the deaths of 10 kings of Macedonia and 11 Ooh. reigns because one of them had two separate like he, he got kicked out and then got it back in 51 years. So 11 reigns in 51 years. That's just wild. Right. And this is his Athens is a neighbor to Macedonia. So it's just next door just to the north. You know, so the longest reigning Macedonian king was during Plato's early life. His name was Archelaus. 
He was a strong, capable ruler. He built roads, reformed the military. Overall, considered very beneficial. Even Athenians liked him. Not Plato, but other Athenians liked him because Athens had lost a huge naval battle and they needed to build a new navy. And Archelaus gave them really favorable terms on new timber. They had a lot of trees. He was like, ah, opportunity. I'll sell you new timber. It worked out really well. The famous Athenian writer Thucydides, great writer, by the way, I've read him. He said he did more for Macedonia's military than all prior Macedonian kings combined. That's Archelaus. But Plato said Archelaus deserved the justice of the gods because Athenians were a democracy. So they didn't look on these kings of Macedonia. They looked on them with extreme disorder. They like, and they looked down on us like, oh, we got it. We got past this stage in our history. We're better than that. But he's not wrong. <laughs> it is better. <laughs> but Archelaus came to power by murdering his uncle and cousin so that his own father could be king. So you again, you have the mixed loyalty here. He didn't kill his own father. He killed his father's brother so that his father could become king and he would be next. He also murdered his own brother so he could become heir to his father. So this guy really was very precise with his murderousness. Yeah. And what's wild about this is he was patient. His father, it wasn't a brief reign for his father. It was 35 years. His father reigned for 35 years. And then, and then Archelaus took over and reigned for 14. That's about how long, apparently, it took the gods to hear Plato's call for justice. So Archelaus was killed, you guessed it, during a hunting trip. <laughs> so <laughs> family blood was spilled again quickly. Archelaus's son, Orestes, was too young to inherit. So Archelaus's brother became co-ruler. Did Erebus surrender full power to Orestes when he came of age? Guess. If you guessed yes, you have not been paying attention. Of course not. Of course Erebus murdered Orestes. <laughs> of course he did. And became king for a while. Uh, and Plato's disciple Aristotle went on to teach Alexander the Great, who was the descendant of Erebus and Orestes and all these guys. Uh, same family, the Ar Argia dynasty. Now here's the, the, the final twist, the family twist that you didn't know you needed. Archelaus's mother may have been a descendant of the Persian general Bubaris. Bubaris was a distant relative to Xerxes the first. So when Alexander the Great overthrew the Persian Empire by defeating Darius the third, they were distant cousins. <laughs> Alexander and Darius. Wow. That brings it full circle. <laughs> totally. I mean, this is like, we're talking about a period of like 500 years of separate, maybe 400 years of separation. So these entangled dynasties go back so far. The marriages between royals, even across major ethnic and religious barriers. I mean, the Persians had a very different culture, very different religions, very different history than the, than the Macedonian Greeks, let alone sheer distance. I mean, Persepolis, thousands of miles from Pella, the capital of Macedonia. Just wild stuff, and, right? <laughs> and, and that's my point. Is like, you know, you barely know these people that you consider strange barbarians from across the globe. You don't speak the same language. So what am I going to do? Ah, I'm just going to send my daughter in marriage because yeah. you never know. That may be a good idea to bring a close connection. It's like... And your family members are just pawns in this game. You yourself are a pawn in this game. And it's weird because, you know, we are used to stories where something horrible is done because there's some bad evil guy, James Bond style, where he's the master genius screwing over everyone else because he benefits. But the funny part about this story is that overwhelmingly, these people don't really benefit. No. You know, they benefit financially. That's about the only way you can say they benefit. But they have less choices. Their kids will have less choices. They're relative. So there's nothing. It's a strange case where the quote-unquote winners of the game are losing, yeah. let alone the losers who are definitely losing, but even the winners are losing. Uh, to, and so it kind of brings some questions up of, you know, why? I mean, if you look even like the whole Alexander the Great thing, like it seemed like a compulsive desire to conquer to the point that his own men were like, what are we doing? We conquer everything we could. What are we doing it for? And, you know, I'm not one usually to quote biblical passages. <laughs> <laughs> It seemed rather fitting. There's a great line where it says, uh, it's quoted in a couple of the gospel, where it says, oh, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and if he should lose his soul? Mm. And in this case, it really seems fitting because this is a game where you are gaining material wealth by the second and losing 
everything else in the name of it. To the point where there's no way you can really be happy. You know, there's no possible way, even a psychopath wouldn't be happy in this kind of situation. I came to use some uh, literary slash uh, movie related examples that kind of tell the same story in other ways. I was recently rewatching the, the Godfather movies. Mm. And it's fascinating to see the difference between Vito Corleone, the old guy, versus his son, Michael Corleone. Because Vito is a gangster. He does run a criminal empire, but everybody loves him. Well, maybe not his enemies, but you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, like, he, was, he was friendly. He yeah. They all adore him. He takes care of his family, he takes care of his friend, he uh, rewards loyalty. There's this system where he's a harsh, brutal, criminal system, but it's in the name of taking care of your tribe, of making sure that everybody in your extended family is taken care of and is happy. So you can get the logic behind it. You know yeah. That's a system that makes sense, regardless of whether you approve morally or not, but there's a that's, I think, why people watch it and they like Vito Corleone, despite the criminality of it all. There's, you sympathize with it because he's a guy who is just doing whatever he does to benefit all the people close to him. You switch to the next generation, and the reason why nobody likes Michael Corleone, even though Michael is probably even more effective than his father, he grows the Corleone empire much bigger than Vito ever was able to. And yet, he is a cold-hearted, loveless bastard in the end, who is rich in cash and miserably poor in friendship and affection and family, too. So it's one of the things where, and to me, is an interesting critique of some cultural patterns. Because, you know, Vito Corleone is very old-school... Uh, Whatever you do in life, you take care of your family and, and friends. Your world is your... There's a sense of... Highly romanticized, by the way, because real-life mafia is probably not like that. But, you know, in terms yeah. of... There's this idea of, like, these uh, honorable values. Whereas Michael is the product of a culture that values one thing and one thing only. That's making money with human relationships being sacrificed if they stand in the way. Of or it. leveraged, yeah, like whatever you can yeah. do, yeah. Hmm. So he's kind of the embodiment of the worst, most extreme aspects of uh, not just capitalism, but like ultra-capitalism, mm. where he's taken to its ultimate, where anything it can be sacrificed as long as the bottom line keeps, as long as the GDP keeps growing, then everything is fine. Yeah, uh, doesn't matter how much environment you need to destroy or people's lives you need to wreck. It's about seeing those numbers go up. And that's kind of the parable you see in The Godfather, where Michael becomes progressively more and more powerful than his father ever was and lonelier and more miserable than his father would have ever been. And so that's kind of where you see how the game is played from... Uh, a game that serves a purpose to a game that serves itself in mm -hmm. the end, where you don't benefit from it anymore. It's like you can never be fully happy. You can always make more money. It's always is this race to the next step that we eventually, if I get there, is going to bring me happiness. And it never does. Yeah. You know, if anything, it gets progressively worse. And then this gets inflicted on, the, on everyone, on all human societies yeah. inflicted by yeah. this style of leadership. I had one other example from farther in Macedonian history that I think really summarizes what people sacrifice and then what gets inflicted on everybody else that they must <laughs> sacrifice as well. This, this stands out because it's an exception and what makes it so startling. According to Plutarch, the court of Antigonus One-Eye. Now, Antigonus One-Eye was one of the major players after the death of Alexander the Great. He almost put together Alexander's entire empire and reconquered it all. At his court, people were shocked when his son, Demetrius the besieger, who was his heir, came home from hunting and sat down next to him. <gasps> sat down next to him. How bizarre a world are we talking when your own son sitting next to you is somehow shocking? Like your son yeah. sat down next to you and people are freaking out? Like that's the most normal thing ever. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's extremely not normal because Demetrius and Antigonus actually had a great relationship. They loved each other and trusted each other. But the fact that it was an exception is really like, wow. So yeah. every other Macedonian king didn't trust his sons. Every other Macedonian lord didn't trust their sons. So you have an entire nation ruled by this attitude, this conceit of don't trust your own children. Like, what's the societal trickle down effect there? No wonder they were just like, yeah, kill your brother. You, it makes sense. Otherwise, he'll kill you. It's not even ruthless. It's just total normal pragmatism. So, woo, I'm glad we don't do that anymore. But, <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting because what you're describing, of course, none of us are going to be the next emperor or have to kill our brother for that's not the reality we are facing. However, if you think about the reality that so many of us face, like if we look at the culture we live in, we live in a culture where it's highly encouraged for kids to split the moment they are 18, go off to college or travel across the country, go live somewhere else. Like the number of people who live relatively close to their families is surprisingly small. And what happens is, you know, you end up seeing each other at Christmas and Thanksgiving, you exchange a letter here and there, but you're not really, and never mind the fact that even when you are at home, most parents are too busy working like dogs, making money to even pay attention to their kids. I mean, I was like, the stuff you said about uh, the king and his son, I notice so often, like when uh, anytime my my daughter is 13 years old now, every time uh, some of her friends come home, they look at her like she's an alien. They are like, mm. you actually talk to your dad? Uh -huh. Like you tell him your problems? You, and they are like, whoa, that is so strange. And, and these are many kids whose parents are not terrible parents. They, I'm sure they are doing good by them in terms of taking care of their needs and even loving them. But there's no real connection because the parents are working all day long. The kids get into their own lives. By the time they are 18, again, you are in the name of, you know, we prioritize so much more the, the job opportunity over the family connection that we don't really have, not only we don't have communities anymore, but even families are... Fracture, it's a war that yeah. loses meaning by the day in that yeah. sense. And, and then you look at the, you know some of the consequences of these and you see, I saw a statistic not so long ago that just blew my mind where one in 10 women and one in seven men in the US report having zero friends. Yeah. Not one friend, not two, not three that are kind of crappy and you only see every few months and you rarely talk to, no, zero friends. That's like 15% of men and 10% of women. Yeah. Let alone all the ones who have one or two friends and, you know, yeah, I guess you have them, but it's not exactly something that makes a huge difference in your life because you rarely see them or talk to them. No, you're talking zero friends. Jeez. These not are good. the ways in which that same idea of quest for, like we have privilege as a society, the making money, getting the job that pays well and that over all else. This is our own personal version of the imperial dreams, the quest for power. You know, I'm going to get the job that brings me this money and then I'll be happy. And then you realize that you live in an extremely lonely world where you have minimal human connections. And so all you can do is you can afford uh, the, the designer label antidepressant. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's where, to me, it becomes interesting when some of these discussions, because they, I mean, if you look at what we have been looking at historically, why do people do it? Like, why did we go down this path of this uh, chasing power at all costs? And, you know, we can throw some theories around. I mean, uh, we can, I guess, I have my ideas, but I'll save them. Like, what do you think? What are, what's the motivation? Well, to chase power at all cost. I think because it's to maybe frame it slightly differently. I think the win at all costs aspect of it is perhaps what makes it so ubiquitous and so uh, has such an effect on all, so many areas of society and, and history. Which is that yes, not only is it about control over other people, but it is about uh, not dying. And ultimately, mm -hmm. that's one of the most important things that that comes to mind about living is not dying and you know humans want to not die we have 
all these instincts and evolved reactions to keep ourselves alive. And one of the best ways we know to keep ourselves alive is to do things in advance of those threats. Like if you live in a bigger house or with taller walls, the lions won't get you, right? The bigger your house, the more floors it has, the, the harder it will be for the lions to get you. Some very basic evolutionary things, I think. But also, yeah, but a lot of it is just our own, what humanity has done in the name of those things over time has evolved into these systems of, uh, of that really magnify that, where it is very explicitly about power and death. And the other things that are mixed in it all fall by the wayside. They're all of lesser importance, perhaps because it's just the ultimate expression of life and death. Um, I don't know. It is a really tough question. I would love to hear listener takes as well. If any of you out there has thoughts on this uh, or, or perhaps you've read certain authors or listen to other podcasters out there that you thought have a really good take on this, we'd love to hear it. Because it's not it's not something we can answer <laughs> definitively. It's something we can talk about and maybe get a little closer to. But yeah, it's more of a target than a goal trying to understand it. Well, when you mention that, to me, that's an interesting one. Right there. Because we can, even the Achilles example, right? When the original choice that we started with was this idea, you can have a long, happy life and nobody will remember you within a generation. Or you can have this short, glorious one, you die early, but your name will live forever. Well, I think that so much of this is also tied to fear of death. Yeah. Because most people want their lives to have meaning. Most people understand that eventually your body is going to go and your life is going to come to an end. And the reality is that 99.9% .9 of people Nobody will ever remember they lived within, at best, you know, never mind, it probably is going to happen really quickly within a couple of generations. But even if you are more generous, within five to ten generations, nobody will remember you were there. So in some ways, especially for people who maybe were born in luxury, were born with wealth, they were born with all those things, those are not necessarily the things that attract their attention. Is They want to leave a legacy specifically and i mean the legacy is horrible when the legacy is about killing your brothers to have power but so it's not a legacy in that sense is they want to live they want their name to last beyond their physical self they want they chase this illusion of everlasting fame that if they are because the thing is if you are number two in the empire and you just pat your brother on the back and you support him but you just retire to live, live a life in luxury you can have a blast, but nobody will remember you. People will remember the top dog in the empire. And so in that sense, there's an ego aspect of, no, I can't just be number two in the empire. I can't just be the next the richest person in the empire. I need to be the top dog because that's the only way that my name will survive past my physical self. Does that explain all of these cases? I highly doubt it. But is it a factor in at least some of them? I do think that's part of the game, that there's a strong ego wanting to last beyond what we know to be the limits of human life. And to be remembered, you have to be more outstanding than other people. That's what That's the difference maker. The thing that people remember is things that are exceptional. And in order yeah. to be exceptional, having the biggest conquest or the largest crown, those are things that people will see as pretty straightforward ways to be remembered. And why do we want to be remembered? That's an right. even deeper question, I suppose. Like you said, it gets into ego. It gets into the sense of self. That's part of why people, some people are so uh, specific about how they raise their children because they see them as extensions of themselves and they mm -hmm. when their child misbehaves they take that personally or if their child doesn't have the same beliefs as them that's separates them from that sense of continuing themselves and you want to also have a sense i think that even 100 years later that if you've created enough your descendants will still have that and they'll still be doing things in your name and still remembering you it's yeah. it's yeah, it's it's grasping for the stars, which you know you can't reach, but every little bit counts, I suppose, is maybe the mindset. Yeah, there's that desire for immortality, yeah. right? That comes with, you know, your physical body cannot, but maybe your name can. 
Yeah. I guess in this regard, like one last thing I want to throw out there, just so to avoid leaving everybody feeling bummed out about <laughs> his history is awful. I would like to tweak it a tiny bit, which is just, are there alternatives to this? Or are humans condemned to this game from here to forever? Because, I mean, right now we're playing in some way the same games, uh, except, uh, you know, rather than dragons, we have nuclear weapons. But, you know, those games are still being played with consequences that can be highly dramatic very quickly. So we are facing things that are existential problems. You know, problems both in the literal sense of existential and also in the sense of existential threats. There's a great line, by the way, that Davos speaks, where he says, if we don't put aside our enemies and band together, we will die. And then it doesn't matter whose skeleton sits on the Iron Throne, mm. you know, which is a beautiful line because it it's is. true. It's like none of these power games mean anything if we don't figure out a way for a better outcome, ultimately, for everybody involved. And that's where I think the power of uh, both, you know, cultures as in you are born in a certain culture, well, that facilitates it. But if you are not in like intentionally trying to shape culture in a direction that may be healthier, because I think so many of these cultures that we discuss are cultures that privilege hierarchy, competition. There's one top dog and everybody has this below. Unless you reach the top, then you're a loser kind of vibe. Rather than a more, how can we play this game so it's not a zero-sum game? How can we both walk away happy from, you know, because the standard issue is I want this, you want that. Well, we'll fight to the death for it. The problem is this never works long term because somebody else comes to fight you for it and so on. So it becomes a, how can we encourage a way of thinking where no solution is a good solution unless all parties walk away, at least accepting the compromise. Maybe it's not their ideal, but feeling like, what is that you want to be happy? This is what I want to be happy. How can we work not simply for me to get my own, but also for you to get at least some of what you need from this? Because otherwise, it's not a solution. Otherwise, it's kind of like finishing World War One and immediately plants the seed for World War Two because you haven't really addressed those root causes. No. So, you know, unless you wipe out your enemy altogether and make them disappear off the face of the earth, the, the conflict is going to pop up again in everything. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, why can't we figure it out where you get? You know, your goal needs to be fulfilled as much as mine. And again, I'm, it's not going to work every time. Sometimes there are things that you cannot reconcile. Mm -hmm. But there are others where as much as humanly possible, the idea of working in more cooperative terms, which I think is something that, that's why I say not all cultures do it, because in cultures in which hierarchy is minimal, this is not even an issue. Because yeah. who the hell wants to be the top dog? There's none of that. There is no top dog position. It's just not even a thing that makes sense culturally. Now, of course, we can't go back to that model anymore. That's long gone, and it's not something we're going to have again. But like, what can we do within this context to at least make the heat simmer on the hyper-competitive material gain, screw everyone else in the process, and work more on uh, cooperation? I think that there is one powerful tool we have now is that with the ability to disseminate information so much that's that's unprecedented mm -hmm. we have the ability to communicate how bad the system is just how drawn to power and and all the problems we have with that and how that's been a problem for thousands of years for almost as long as human existence and we can look at the, like you said it's a good to try to end on a more positive note say take the indus valley civilization one of the oldest civilizations ever to exist they were they were gone by like the year 3000 BC. There is almost no evidence of warfare, of weapon making. They had advanced plumbing and all these other great things. So it, it is possible to have societies that have different values that aren't winner take all, that aren't let's all be like the bloody murderer and get as much power as we can. There is cracks in that foundation of that old system and evidence that it hasn't always been the only system. And shows like House of the Dragon, I think, frankly, help with that. We show, like, these people, they're not 
likable, like we've said all throughout the episode there. But we do. But you could see how they could be likable if their right. lives had gone differently. Allison wasn't born unlikable. Maybe Otto right. was, but we haven't seen him as a kid. <laughs> but uh, Rhaenyra born pretty likable, you know, and then, you know, as power and age and battle and cynicism and people telling them paranoid things just takes its toll. If they were in a different system, they probably would have been fine. They probably wouldn't decent human beings that could have raised their children and been happy. But they weren't taught that. Like you said, they were taught this other family is going to come kill you. So that's your primary objective yeah. is to kill them first or get so much power that they can't kill you or or both. And yeah, I uh, I wonder if we also have to think about, like you said, history records the the killers and the murderers. But the people that did sit there in second place and were content with that, they did exist. There were lots yep. of them. There had to have been lots of them. There's always somebody in second place. It wasn't like every single person mm -hmm. always rebelled against their older brother. There were lots yep. of examples. They're just not prominent. But they did happen. Yep. They clearly happened. We just need to maybe emphasize them a little more and say, look, those people had good lives. They were happy. Yeah, no one remembers them. But who cares? <laughs> they yep. don't care. They're not going to be worried about that when they're dead. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's how I try to make a point sometimes, because it's very easy for me to do episodes about conquerors and wars and these, and I do those episodes. And they are part of history and they're an important part of history. But I do feel it's important for me to also branch out sometime and do episodes on people who were just interesting human beings, who are good human beings, who did some stuff that, no, they never became the leader of a nation or conquer half of the world, but they had good lives, you know, and I think it's important to put the accent on it because we don't do it enough. In fact, one of your episodes comes to mind here. Who did we cite in this example, in this episode, as the ultimate uh, acquirer of the ultimate, like, capitalist who couldn't stop? He's Alexander the Great, right? He wanted to, he conquered more of the known world than anyone ever conquered, and he wanted yeah. to keep going. But what happened in you did an episode what happened when he met diogenes who owned nothing diogenes was an aggressive poor person he was aggressively poor yes. meaning he aggressively he maintained his poor. poverty he wanted to be poor and he kept it that way he believed it was correct there, there are a couple of fantastic lines about the interactions between alexander and diogenes one that when alexander conquered the town where uh, Diogenes was. He went to see him as Diogenes was like sunbathing in the middle of a square naked laying there. And uh, Alexander was like, I heard so much about you. Everybody say you're this brilliant, wise person. You know, ask anything you want of me. Uh, what can your desires will be satisfied? What do you want? And Diogenes' reply was like, Mind stepping away because you're casting a shade. Stay out of my sight. <laughs> what's wow. so great because it's like the little things he's really like this is all this is what matters to me like this is the little yeah. things this is the sunlight on my body that feels good and yeah that's what i care about yeah and then there's another one that supposedly uh maybe it was a continuation of these but there's a line where alexander said you know if i had not been alexander i would have loved to be diogenes <laughs> and diogenes said if i had not been diogenes i would have still loved to be diogenes <laughs> That's so good, but too, because it's just it, it really encapsulates so much what we're trying to say here. It's like Alexander f could have been Diogenes. Like he has all the power in the world. If he wanted to be Diogenes, he could. But like yeah. apparently he couldn't. He couldn't just do that. He couldn't be like, I can't give all this up. I because right. like we said, that stuff does kind of entrap you. It does kind of enslave. Diogenes grasped that. He was like, mm -hmm. this stuff does enslave you in a sense. Not yep. not literally, but it does yeah. trap does. you. Yeah. We didn't plan on ending with that comparison but man that works pretty well <laughs> that was fun i'm glad you pulled that out that was great <laughs> yeah it was your episode that i listened to to remind me of that i had read about it before but it was it was like 25 years ago so yeah listening to right. you talk about that I was like oh yeah you did a whole see and you did a whole episode on him that's really good so y'all if you haven't heard Danielle's episode on diogenes this is your clue to go do that and you could do that right now because this is our cue to end the episode thanks to Danielle for the collaboration and we'll see you next time for more until then, Valar reread us.